In the last several videos, we've been discussing how to solve parabolic partial differential equations using finite difference methods. We began by looking at explicit methods. We saw that they were very easy to formulate and implement, but they had numerical stability issues. Then we discussed in the last two videos how to evaluate numerical stability, and we did so for the first order explicit method using two techniques, the matrix method and the von Neumann or Fourier analysis approach. Now we're going to seek to address the numerical stability deficiencies of explicit methods by introducing implicit methods in this video. We're going to look at two, first order implicit method and then the Crank-Nicholson method. In our previous videos we saw that explicit methods are very straightforward to implement, but they're notoriously prone to numerical stability issues. We often have a criteria on the time step that has to be small enough in order to prevent numerical instability. So we'd like to address that, we'd like to mitigate that, and we do that using implicit methods. It turns out to be a rather dramatic improvement, as we'll see, using our 1D unsteady diffusion equation as a model problem. So remember the first order explicit method that we talked about in an earlier video. We use central difference approximations for the spatial derivatives at the previous or nth time level, and then we use the first order accurate forward difference in time. The x marks the spot, gives us the location where we're approximating the differential equation. Here it's at i, n, so it's at the previous time step. So we have a central difference in x, and then a forward difference in time. Now, for the first order implicit method, we're going to shift the x marks the spot to the current or n plus first time level. And then we'll use a backward difference in time take care of the time derivative, as you'll see. So here's how it looks. We have the nth time step where we know the solution, the n plus first time step where we're seeking the solution, and then the i minus one i and i plus one grid locations. Delta t, of course, is the time step. So the x marks the spot now is at the current n plus first time level. That's where we approximate the equation. We use second order accurate central differences in space at the current time level and then a backward difference in time for the time derivative. So here's how it looks. We have ui n plus one minus ui n over delta t. That is first order accurate. That is a backward difference. And then we have a second order accurate central difference for the second derivative of u with respect to x. You'll notice all of these are at the n plus first time level. It's first order accurate in time second order accurate in space, just like the first order explicit method. But as you'll see, there's gonna be a dramatic improvement in the numerical stability properties of this approach. So as we always do, let's take the unknowns and pull them to the left side, all the knowns, and put them on the right side of the equation. So these n plus ones, those are all unknown. So we'll take those over to the left, and then the only known is the uin here. So we have three terms on the left-hand side, corresponding to ui plus one, ui, and ui minus one, and then only the one term on the right-hand side. But this is now a tridiagonal system of equations that we could solve implicitly, that's why we call it an implicit method, we could solve implicitly for the solution at the current time level. So rather than having one equation that we apply at every point at the current time level to update its approximation, we now solve simultaneously in a coupled fashion a system of equations, which in this case is tridiagonal, for all the values of u at the current time level. So the idea is to improve on stability. Let's move as many of the unknowns to the current time level as possible. We'll have more unknowns, but maybe that will improve on stability. So we can solve our tridiagonal system using the Thomas algorithm that we've discussed in earlier videos. It is strongly diagonally dominant. You'll notice 1 plus 2s is bigger than 2s. So it is strongly diagonally dominant tridiagonal system, so therefore Thomas algorithm will always work to solve this. Now let's look at a von Neumann stability analysis. We, we discussed this analysis in the previous video, so if you haven't seen that, watch that. We're gonna apply that analysis to this particular situation. So here is our difference equation, but now with u replaced with the error. Remember the argument is that the exact u and the approximate u both have to satisfy the difference equation and therefore the error has to satisfy the difference equation, the error being the difference between those two values of u. So we just substitute in e for u, and we have our error equation. Then we expand the error at t sub n using a Fourier series expansion. 
So these exponentials, those are the Fourier series, and then we have the amplitude at the initial time times g sub m, which is the gain for mode m to the nth power to get to that nth time step. So go back to the previous video to see where this comes from. Now we substitute this expansion into here. Remember, the subscripts tell us where we are in x. x shows up in the exponential. So here we're at i plus 1, so that's x plus delta x. Here is i, so that's x. Here's i minus 1, so that's x minus delta x. On the right-hand side, it's i, so that's x. Then the superscript here tells us which time step we're at, and that gives us the power of the gain. Remember, the gain is how much the amplitude changes from one time step to the next. So here we have n plus 1, so that's g sub m to the power n plus 1. Here we have n plus 1 again, g sub m to the power n plus 1, n plus 1, same thing here, and then n, so that's g sub m to the power n. Then every term has a g sub m to the power n in it, so we can cancel those. And also, every term has an e to the i theta sub m x. So we can cancel all of those as well. And then what we have left is the s times the remaining g sub m, that g sub m is here, times e to the i theta sub m times delta x. You see that right here. Here it's an e to the i theta sub m x. So that's gone, so this term shows up right here and then e to the i theta m x minus delta x, this part's gone, so it's an e to the minus i theta sub m delta x from this term right here. And then on the right-hand side, the g sub m to the power n times e to the i theta sub m x has been canceled, so we're just left with minus 1. So now we have this expression in square brackets times the gain is equal to minus 1. Let's simplify this expression a bit before we solve for g sub m. So just as we saw in the last couple videos, if we have e to the plus i something plus e to the minus i something, we can write that as a cosine. And then we can simplify this expression a bit to this. And now we have a 1 minus cosine of something. And remember, that's related to sine squared. I've gone through this a little bit quickly because we've seen this in the last couple of videos as well. So we have something times g sub m is equal to 1. Solving for g sub m then, we have 1 over that coefficient, which is now 1 plus 4s sine squared of theta sub m delta x over 2. So it's 1 plus something that's always positive. s is always positive, sine squared is always positive, so this number in square brackets is always bigger than 1. So 1 over something that's bigger than 1, of course, is always less than 1. So therefore, all of the modes are stable. The gain for every single mode is less than or equal to 1 by magnitude. So we say that this particular method, the first order implicit method, is unconditionally stable. There are no conditions for which it is unstable. It's unconditionally stable. That's the best case you could hope for. We don't have to worry about the value of s at all in terms of numerical stability. Now it is only first order accurate, so it's no better than the first order explicit method in terms of temporal accuracy, but it's much better in terms of numerical stability. There are more computations required per time step. We're now solving a tridiagonal system of equations at each time step as we advance the solution. That's clearly a lot more work than just updating each value using the explicit expression that we had in the first order explicit method. The key, however, is that by eliminating the concern for numerical stability, we now only need to determine the delta t that's necessary for numerical accuracy. Remember, in the explicit methods, we had to worry about accuracy and stability. And usually, it's the stability criteria that limits the time step more than the accuracy. Here, we're removing that limitation on delta t because of stability, we can now just focus on numerical accuracy. So typically, we'll be taking larger time steps. And even though we'll be doing more calculation per time step, in the aggregate, it'll take much less time. Now we still have an issue, and that is that the method is only first order accurate in time. So we would like to have a second order accurate scheme in time, so a second order accurate time and space. So that brings us to the Crank-Nicholson method, also called the trapezoid method. Remember for the explicit method, the x marked the spot was here, implicit method it was here, and that's what causes us to have to use either a forward or a backward difference, which is only first order accurate. 
If we could approximate midway in between those two points and use a second order accurate central difference, then we'd have second order accuracy in time. Now this doesn't correspond to one of our two time levels, so we'll have to think about what that means. But let's just try it and see what happens. So we have our i minus 1, i, i plus 1 finite difference stencil, as we have before. We have now our x marks the spot half a time step ahead of and half a time step before the previous and the next time steps. And then of course our delta x grid spacing as we've had all along. Okay, so let's see what this means. So now when we apply this to the unsteady 1D diffusion equation, same equation we've been using all along so far in this chapter, we now have uin plus 1 minus uin over delta t, but that is now a second order accurate approximation because it's the central difference approximation for that first derivative. Now the question is, what do we do about the spatial derivatives? We're not approximating the spatial derivatives at the previous or at the current time level. We're approximating them here. So how do I get partial squared u partial x squared there? Well, if I got partial squared u partial x squared here and here, I could take the average of both of those, and that would give us the value at the midpoint. So that's going to look like this. We have alpha, our diffusivity, times partial squared u partial x squared. And what we'll do is we'll apply that at the n plus first time level and the nth time level, and then take the average of those two. So one half of the sum of those two. So then we just use second order accurate central differences for each of these derivatives. So we have a here and here. The only difference being that this one is at the n plus first time level, whereas this one is at the nth time level. Add them up, divide by two, and we have the average, the value at the midpoint. Now you remember that we showed earlier in the chapter that averaging across time levels in this way is actually second order accurate in time. So we are introducing a little bit more error, but that error due to the averaging is no bigger than, it's no worse than the error that is introduced by the second order accurate central difference in time. Pulling the unknowns over to the left, the knowns to the right, we now get this expression here. So everything with n plus one goes to the left, everything with n goes to the right. So you'll notice on the left, it looks very similar to what we had before for the first order implicit method. It's not exactly the same, but it's similar. We have three unknowns, i minus one, i, i plus one. And now we have more on the right hand side, but all of that is known and we can calculate. So again, we have a triadagonal system of equations that we would solve implicitly for the values of u, the approximation at the next time step. Every time step, requires a Thomas call to solve that tridiagonal system of equations. So essentially it's the same approach as we had for the first order implicit method. It's just that we have more stuff on the right hand side to calculate. So now we have second order accuracy in time and space. So that's good. Turns out to be unconditionally stable. So again, I can choose my delta t, my time step only for numerical accuracy. I don't have to be concerned at all with numerical stability. I can take ridiculously large delta t's, ridiculously large s's, and it will still be stable. It may not be accurate, but it will remain stable. So that's great. So, so this is good, this is good. If we do have to apply derivative boundary conditions, we would do so at the current time level. We don't have to do it at that half time level, it'll be at the current. As I said before, this is also known as the trapezoid method. And because of these accuracy and stability properties, this is a very popular scheme for solving parabolic equations. Very straightforward to implement, just tridiagonal systems of equations that we can solve using the Thomas algorithm at each time step. Now one thing I want to emphasize is if you go back and look at the first order explicit method, first order implicit method, and the Crank-Nicholson method, if you just look at how we approximated the partial u, partial t term, they all look the same. They're all ui n plus one, minus ui n divided by delta t. So they all look the same, but one is a forward difference, one is a backward difference, one is a central difference. The only way to tell is to look at the x marks the spot. So even though they look the same, they are not the same approximation of that first order derivative in time. So I just want you to be careful and be aware of that. Now if you have nonlinear terms in your unsteady parabolic partial differential equation, then explicit methods typically lead to very restrictive time steps, even worse than for the linear case, in order to maintain numerical stability. Now implicit methods still have these improved stability properties, but now you're going to have to iterate at each time step in order to get the solution before you move to the next time step. So you'd have a loop 
within a loop. So you do your time stepping, and at each time, you're going to have to iterate until convergence to take into account the nonlinearity of your differential equation. And we'll take a look at that in a later video in this chapter.